Welcome back. Well, this is a dual uh, interview with me and Dr. Lauren Stryker, and we're going to have a back and back conversation about testosterone. So, Dr. Stryker, thank you and for joining me. And this is pretty risky because both of us like to talk a lot. So, it's going to be in, it's <laughs> two podcast interviewers trying to have a conversation. And we're going to release this on both of our podcasts, and because we just need to finally have a hopefully nuance. We, we were talking before this, like it's hard to talk about testosterone in 180 characters. Like Instagram is not the place to educate people on testosterone. No, and which is why we get a lot of backlash on it because you say one little thing and then everybody jumps on it and says that's not true and it's you know things are apparently, always apparently lauren has just informed me that people think i'm trying to get the entire world on testosterone you have <laughs> which been is like, of that, which is like that's on them I never, I've them. never, those words have never come out of my mouth i do think that women should be educated i do think we need more research i do think I, we need I a product and, that can be a and and I, dose. you and i both agree that women are smart they just need to be given the facts so that they can figure out what's right for them. And the truth is, is while you get accused of being the, you know, the testosterone uh, queen, and <laughs> I don't have that title yet, but I honestly think I am guessing that we are going to be in agreement on more things than not, if not everything. I mean, we both agree. We both agree. Testosterone is a human hormone, right? We're, 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 testosterone is a human hormone. Did you, yes. did you learn that in medical school? I didn't learn anything in medical school. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. When I first started my residency in OBGYN, I look back and it's astonishing what I didn't know and that I didn't kill women right and left. And that's because I had people who were watching every single thing that I did, but I really knew very little. But forget medical school. I didn't learn this stuff in residency. When we're yeah. really supposed to be learning, and I didn't learn anything about menopause, I certainly didn't learn anything about testosterone. When I first started learning testosterone, interestingly, was there was a product called Libby Gel, which um, was going for FDA approval. Testosterone, of course, is not FDA approved for women, and they tried very hard to get it approved. So there were clinical trials going on, the Libby Gel trials, and at that time I was already attending, and I was asked to participate in the Libby Gel trials, and I said, sure, and I'm thinking, I don't know anything about testosterone. So that's when I first started to read about it and learn about it and know something about it. And... um and what's so interesting is it never did get FDA approval, not because it wasn't safe, not because it wasn't effective, but because of some craziness on the part of the FDA that they were requiring things that no pharmaceutical company would do without you know, spending a crazy amount of money. But as we talk about the data, and I know we're going to get into the data a little bit, a lot of that was from the Libby Gel trials, which were mm -hmm. you know, 2010, 2011, right around then is when all those studies were coming out. So what was your journey? When did you first learn about testosterone? Um, so I'm a urologist. Well, you're a urologist, right? So, so you like we're, we're, we so, breathe so to, testosterone. Yeah, to me, I'm like I, testosterone. It does not scare me, right? Because I think so many people because they don't know about it. They're like, it's probably scary. It's got a class three FDA schedule on it, so which so does ketamine and so does co codeine with Tylenol. So it must be unsafe, right? And I think it really gets this bad rap because of abuse of synthetic anabolic steroids that happens in sport. But that's not exactly what, that's what not what right. most people and, take this for. Well, you know, the other thing also in terms of terminology, you and I and most menopause experts, of course, use the term hormone therapy, not hormone replacement therapy. And the reason for that is, is that we're not trying to give higher than normal doses. We're not trying to even necessarily replace exactly what someone was making in terms of hormones. We're doing therapy to get to an appropriate level that's going to benefit someone in terms of how they feel in long-term issues. So that's why we use the yes. term hormone therapy. And I think that's also really appropriate when we talk about testosterone because yeah. there isn't a specific level that we're headed for. We're looking for specific goals, right? Yep. And I think, you know, what I try to say a lot, I think because of the stigma of testosterone is I like to say physiologic dosing, physiologic yeah. dosing, right. which, which people will interpret to be like, what level should I be at? And yeah. the guidelines say, how do you feel? Right. Do you feel like it's benefiting you without having side effects? How do you because, feel without getting into trouble without side yeah, effects? Exactly. Yeah. And we can talk about that and, and why it's gotten a bad rap and what happens when people give too much. But I think we are absolutely in agreement that, um, you know, that 
that women benefit from taking testosterone and, and some women benefit more than others. And, yeah, there's, and I think there's at the top of my list, working. and I want to hear who, who you most benefit, think most benefits, but I look at women who've had ovary removal because when we look at where testosterone is made, of course, most of it's made in the adrenal glands, almost half of it's made in the ovaries. And even the postmenopause ovary continues to pump out some, not as much as it used to, you know, the levels go down, but postmenopause women are still making testosterone, but if they've had their ovaries removed, their levels are a whole lot lower and they're generally going to benefit more. What do you think? Yeah. And what's so crazy about that is if you look at data, these are old studies, 1985, 1987, like mm -hmm. this is not groundbreaking work of people saying, when we take their ovaries out, let's give them estrogen and testosterone. Yeah. They did that. They published the data. They said they do well. And now it's like, we're having this brand new yeah. conversation again. Right. It's like, well, it's like fact, the Iron Curtain came yeah. down with the WHI and like, we forgot we've actually done a lot of this research already. And, and the work has been done. And quite frankly, a lot of that was done in the Libby Gel trials. And the women who were enrolled in Libby Gel were women who'd had a surgical menopause. That was one of the criteria is they wanted to get a group of women who truly were testosterone deficient. Yeah, and the testosterone that was approved in the, in Europe that is now off the market, that was approval only for surgical menopause women. Yeah. And, and one of the arguments was like, listen, it didn't sell because there's just not that many women. I mean, there's still a lot of women who've had their ovaries removed, but it's a small part of the population. And if that drug was only for them, because they didn't say it was for all postmenopausal, it didn't do well. And then it, it went away. Correct. Correct. Well, let's, okay. What I'd like to know is if we are in agreement in terms of what goals we have when we recommend testosterone for someone and in what situations you think it's appropriate, because for, I, you've been talking about it a lot more in your podcast than, than I have. I have a testosterone um, episode from season one, but I haven't really been focusing on it. So just to get my folks up to speed, um, when, when most people are talking about testosterone replacement, the kind of you know, straight academic, they are talking about it to improve libido because the, the Libby gel trials were specifically about treating women with low libido who wanted to make it better. So the data that we have is primarily, primarily for women with low libido, which isn't to say to your point that there may not be other benefits, but that's the data. And that's the why people that are sticking to, you know, the, the being the, the ivory tower academicians are the ones that are saying it's okay to give women testosterone, which is still off label because it's not FDA approved. And of course, as I say all the time, off label does not mean it's illegal or inappropriate. It just means the FDA has not given it their blessing. Birth control pills for cramps are off label. Um, so but, birth but, control you know, for skin for acne is off label. It's off label. Birth control pills to regulate your cycles is off label. The only thing birth control pills are on label for is to prevent pregnancy. So just we can take the off label thing is not a problem. And 80% of women at some point in their life have been on a birth control pill. That's right. And 30% of them are taking it for something other than contraception. <laughs> we so, digress. We digress. Um, but the point so is, is we, 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 we toss out the term off label. And I just want to be clear that off label is not a bad thing. It's just a category of things that yeah. are not FDA approved for a specific indication. So, all right. So, so this is the thing. It's real easy. I think for me and other menopause experts to say that post-menopause women who are having trouble with low libido will benefit from testosterone supplementation in physiologic uh, dosages to get them to a level that's physiologic and that this may help them, not 100%. You know, we're looking at 50, 60%. If their low libido is because of low testosterone. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, right, but you got to know, you gotta know a lot about low libido to be like, testosterone is not going to help everybody here. Right, and I always say what people sometimes really need is, is HRT, which is a husband replacement therapy to help, their, <laughs> to help their low libido. I mean, it's multifactorial, let's be honest here. So, but the point, but you know, no, I think it's important though, because when we say testosterone isn't going to work for everybody for low libido, of course it's not. Nothing's going to work right. for everybody. Everybody, right, which is you know? why people I think hate on um, like the testosterone, but but yeah, estrogen works great. Um, not working twenty two hours a day is yeah. good for your libido. Like their libido is so complex that right. to put the weight of libido on one hormone is incredibly uh, insulting to yeah. to how complex humans are. But I mean, okay, so, go, right, so, I want, okay, so I want you to start with talking about. So I've said okay, libido. Why don't you kind of give your laundry list? 
of if a patient were to come to you and say, my libido is fine. I have no problem with libido. Am I a candidate for testosterone? What's it going to do for me? What would you tell that yeah. woman? Well, for, I mean, for two things. Number one, do people are like, do you think everybody, do I need testosterone? People will ask that on Instagram. Do I need testosterone? No, nobody, nobody needs this. You're probably not going to die sooner. Like nobody needs it, but it can be helpful. And I like to clarify that. Number two, I think this is a case of the tail wagging the dog for lack of a better metaphor, help me out. But people are like, it's only, it's, we only have approval and we have the most studies for low libido. Yes. Why? Because the FDA said, when we approve this, we're going to approve it for low libido. The money follows what the regulation says they're going to do it for. So until the FDA says, we want to look at this for hypogonadism, which is what it's approved for in men, which yeah. I think is true get gender equality. Let's get it for hypogonadism for all genders. You're going to have more studies on low libido when the FDA is like, that's what we're going to approve it for if we're going to approve it for anything. Right. So and it's, also, a, it's a very point, circular you know, argument. What, what people don't realize is to get FDA approval costs an average of, you know, what, $100 million in 12 to 15 years to get your drug to the drugstore, and most of them don't even make it. So the more focused somebody is, the more likely it is to be approved. That's why most of these drugs are just for one very specific indication. Ozempic, they know for example, get prescribed for other indications. They just need to get it out there. Ozempic is not FDA approved for weight loss. No, right, right. It's used off label for that. Right. But they needed a smaller niche. They needed to be in diabetics with weight equaling blah blah blah. Like they had to be very narrow, and then you right. expand it. But for people to argue that the only indication is for low libido. This is the best, this is the easiest way I've got. Where's libido? Libido's in the brain. Oh, okay. So testosterone works on the brain. Yes, testosterone works on the brain. Okay. One little teeny spot in the brain? No, the brain, right? And we have data on that. We have data in men. We can use data in men. We are similar beings, right? And it's like the cognitive changes. And Lauren, you know this, you give a woman testosterone, she'll come back, she might say my libido's better or it's not. And then she'll say, but, but I feel she better. will tell you what feels better. Yeah. I had a woman last week and I know, I know this is anecdotal, but it's, it, it, you can't study some things. It's very hard to study feeling more like myself. It's a very hard thing to study. This woman said, you know, that part in the wizard of Oz where you go from black and white to technicolor, She's like, that's what my brain does on this. And she's like, so I stopped it to see if I was just maybe making that up. My world went into black and white again. And no, she doesn't yeah. have vision problems. It's her brain using this testosterone. She's like, the world is interesting again. Yeah. And it's like, but how are you going to get, the, you're not going to get an FDA also. approval for the world is interesting. And the, right. They talk about all these quality of life tests and all that. But if, I don't know if you've ever looked at the questions on there, but they're kind of silly, I think. Um, and I don't think that's a very and good it's measure. It's very hard of, to do as far as measuring like dementia or changes in like significant yeah. enough to measure dementia. It's yeah. very hard to measure that under with short short studies. But but the concept to your point of hormones that we think of as sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, being important in places in the body other than the reproductive system for most women is news. Quite frankly, for a lot of doctors, it's news, you know, that they don't appreciate the fact that there are hormone receptors throughout the body and the you know bones and joints. And we talk about all this stuff, including the brain. Freaking and heart palpitations that go yeah. away when you give a woman estrogen. That's right. And, and so much of what we're really studying now and learning about now, I mean, it seems like every day a new article is talking about the impact of estrogen on fill in the blank. You know, I did a podcast episode on estrogen and dry mouth. And I thought, how many people can this be? It went <laughs> off the charts, you know, because yes. there are estrogen receptors in the salivary glands. And the, actually the inside of the mouth is a lot like the inside of the vagina, just saying it really is. Um, yeah. but, but, it, but that's the point is that we're still learning so much. And all right, so we, we got to wait for what I want like, to ask. It, it, so let's talk about what are the kinds of things other than a general sense of well-being. I feel like myself. I feel good. I feel energetic. Give me the specific kind of go down your list of what you tell women the specific benefits are potentially of taking testosterone. So I'm very vague to them because I, I want to under promise and over deliver. 
Meaning, I'm not going to tell you, the world's going to be in technicolor. Like, I can't tell you what other women tell me and, and promise that that's going to happen to you. I don't know no, that. that's anecdotal. That's just something It's anecdotal. We don't do that. So I say, <laughs> the, the only real approval, not FDA approval, but like authorization in 14 different languages is for low libido. I think it's ridiculous that a woman gets an indication to sleep with another human as the only indication. It actually makes no sense. But- so what would I tell women? I'm like, listen, women come back saying different things. I can finally make gains in the gym. I'm sleeping better. Does help hot flashes a little bit. Helps mood a lot. A woman's like, I just want to kind of get up and do stuff in my house again. I kind of want to like yeah. get up and get my to-do but, list accomplished. Okay. So, okay. But that's quality of life stuff. That's I feel better. I feel more like myself. <laughs> what I want to know Which I would is, argue is the most important thing to help people with in medicine. I think there are two most important things. I think in terms of short-term quality of life and long-term, is this going to extend my life or make me healthier down the road? I'm in it for the long haul. So when I talk about hormone therapy and people say, when should I go off my estrogen is when my hot flashes are over. And I'm like, oh my God, no. You know, your entire cardiovascular system, your brain, your bones, your muscles, your vulva, your vagina, everything is going to continue to benefit until you're dead. So therefore yeah. you stay on until you're dead. So what I want to know from you, Dr. Kasperson, is if someone says, you know, I'm feeling terrific, I am fine, I want to know, is testosterone going to help my bones, my brain, my muscles, all of that that's going to help me live a longer, healthier life? What is your response yeah. to that? We've got data to say yes. And this is where, you know, I, I, I hesitate to be pigeonholed into the person who tells everybody to be on testosterone, right? Because people no, get but, pissy but, about that, but it's no, like- No, but let me interrupt you one second. We both agree and we have data that shows- We have data that, that shows- That estrogen is going to help in terms of cardiovascular health and brain health and cognitive function. We could go through all that, but we still don't tell everybody everybody needs to be on estrogen. There are exactly so right. many other exactly things. Right. You know, these people who say, well, I'm going to take estrogen, but I'm going to eat processed food all day and drink a bottle of wine at night and sit on my ass, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that estrogen's really not going to really going to be the well. You know, there's so many other fair. components. So yeah, we have data for the brain. I think testosterone's the missing element for dementia. Like I will go that far. We've got the data in men. We've got the data in frailty. We have a, a new paper got published looking at phosphorylation of the tau protein, specifically in women who have the APO4E allele for Alzheimer's disease. Right? Like we have preliminary data. Okay, but we have this. that same data for estrogen looking at the tau Our protein. Our bodies are complex. We might need more than one hormone. No, no, Lauren. but I'm just saying my, my point <laughs> is, is we have that data that shows that there's not as many tau tangles in women who mm -hmm. take estrogen as opposed to women who don't. Have you ever heard any doctor talk about that other than, you know, the little group of, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but so we already have that data for estrogen and it's not an indication for estrogen. And, and then we're saying, okay, so testosterone is potentially, we don't, we don't have the longitudinal data, you know, this, the placebo controlled trial that we give a thousand women testosterone and a thousand women placebo, and we watch them for 50 years and then say, you know, less women got Alzheimer's. That's the data that the purists are waiting for. They want, they want, women, and we don't have. The, and we'll, the Gen and we'll X women who are seeing their parents age will not wait for this data to happen. Yeah, it's a bit. The, the WHI was a billion dollar study, and we know the good and the bad that came from that, and how long that took, and that we're yeah. still digesting it. W who's holding their breath for the next two billion dollar study? Not gonna on this? It's not it going to happen. It's not going to happen. It will not happen. No, I know it will not happen. Okay, let me ask you this because I, I rarely ask questions that I don't know the answer to because that's what always a good podcast host does, right? But I don't know the answer to this one, and you will. What is it FDA approved for in men other than hypogonadism? Hypogonadism. That's it? Mm hmm Like there's no specific other things? Like, <laughs> you know, that's it? Yes. Oh, okay. It's used off-label for libido. It's used off -la It's not FDA approved for men for right, libido. Okay, well, that's good. So I did know the answer to that, and I thought I didn't. It's not, unless I'm wrong, but it's... it's no, you're it's never it's wrong. It's Um Oh, that's so that's so nice coming from you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we use, we use testosterone off-label in men all the time. And, and that's the other question. Are we gatekeeping differently between genders? I see that a lot more. In, oh, well, come on. Because, you know, I've done how many episodes on the orgasm gap between men and women? You know, it's not just the orgasm gap. Which isn't gap. getting it's, better, it's, by it's, the way. No, it's not. Uh, Lori Mintz, uh, she just, you know, um, Lori. Testosterone helps orgasm. Have you noticed? 
Yeah, well, sure, because it's those afferent pathways. I mean, look, there's testosterone receptors nice throughout the lower third of the vagina, the vulva, the clitoris. We know that. Yeah. We know that. But, uh, but we've but, got we've but got we people. Also, Let's okay, go well, for something that's big. Let's go with well, let's go with osteoporosis and hip fracture. We've got some studies showing that estrogen plus testosterone has better bone markers than estrogen alone. Yeah. So you know we've got. I think you know people's pro. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for other people. People's problem with me. My well my my problem is people saying we have no data, and and what I do is I dig up the data we do have. And say, let's work with what we have. I am not saying yeah. anything that I haven't seen published somewhere, or at in the bare minimum is anecdotally coming back to my clinic, right? When and women reporting this, but when people say we have no data, they're just massively not curious because I've read most of this stuff. Well, I think the, the problem, but with I'm a nerd. No data. No, no. I, yeah, I know you are, and that's why I love you. But the, <laughs> the problem with having no data is that. I feel like we have an obligation to say, I don't like if someone says, let's talk about safety for a minute. And then we're going to go back to what it does for you. Cause we think in terms of safety for testosterone. Oh, I love the safety testosterone discussion. So we the safety issue, this. I think for me is very, very clear cut. We have excellent 12 month data that shows that testosterone in appropriate levels is safe. And I have no reason to think it's not safe long term. But if you were to say, do we have 30 year data, 40 year data? We do not. We yes, don't have we that do. for estrogen either. Yes, well, we then do. You have to point me that direction. In women, in women, not men. Yes, we do. Who? Okay, tell me. Educate Are you ready? Me. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I've got my Abdul, notepad. Out. Dr. Abdul Trash, PhD, published a study. I can send it to you. So let me set the stage. What if we take a drug? And we ask people, are you willing to take this drug? But I want to, I want to give it to you at 10 times the dose. Have we ever done that with any drug? And then these people are like, yes, and I want to keep taking it. And I want to keep taking it for 30 years, willingly. <laughs> okay, but it's 10 times the dose. No, I want to keep doing that. All right, so we've let those people keep taking 10 times the dose of the drug for 30 years and we watched them and they don't have increased risk of cancer and they don't have increased risk of heart disease and they don't have increased risk of blood clot. Who are those people? Trans men. You know, that's, yes, I have heard you now that you say that. And, but it's interesting. But the other thing also is um, little known fact about me before I became interested in menopause, my area of interest was minimally invasive surgery, hysterectomy, and alternatives to hysterectomy. And I was the queen and one of the first in Chicago to do outpatient laparoscopic hysterectomy. And who found their way to me? Trans men. Because men, people who are transitioning from female to male and are taking high doses of testosterone for a variety of reasons, want to get rid of their uterus. Mm -hmm. And in that time, it wasn't covered by insurance, of course. So they wanted it to be outpatient. And they found their way to me because, first of all, I was welcoming and my office and staff were welcoming. And we very quickly learned language and appropriateness and all that kind of stuff. But um, if you are doing a laparoscopic hysterectomy, you need to go through the vagina in order to just technically do uh, don't do what you need to do surgically. And in this population, you you really couldn't have access to the vagina. So I figured out a way to do it without vaginal access. I kind of jerry-rigged something and I made something up, which is the fun of being a surgeon and being kind of creative and solving problems in the operating room. And word got out. So suddenly I was doing hysterectomies on so many trans guys. Um, and And the reason, there were two reasons briefly to have their uterus out. One is because some were having reconstructive plastic surgery and they needed to get rid of their vagina and their uterus. But beyond that, it's because they were going to be taking long-term testosterone. And testosterone, one of the metabolic products of testosterone is estrogen. And if you take estrogen long-term without a progestogen to counteract it, you have an increased risk of uterine cancer. So they all wanted to get rid of their uteruses so that they didn't have to worry about taking long-term testosterone. So I'm going to counter you on we have this test in, 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 in men who are taking testosterone for 30 years who are 
you know, genetically, biologically women, um, there's a difference between those that have a uterus and those that don't in terms of safety. And I think that that's something that we have to at least throw out there. That yeah, I mean, the data I've is, seen is, is on, you know, the data I've seen on female dose testosterone is that it's anti-proliferative to the endometrial lining. Correct. So that so now we're talking about ten times the but dose. We're talking for that about one. ten times that dose. But yeah. as far as breast cancer, heart disease, like significant stuff that pops up, it's not happening. That was it, never the issue. It was I mean, never the from, issue. Yeah, from yeah. my point of view. And I agree with you on that. And the, the other, it's also, it's also not the issue for estrogen, you right. know, and, and people, but also when we talk about the trans population, and this is really a whole other topic, but it's interesting. So we'll just go with it for a little bit. When you talk about the trans population, they have a lot of different ways of taking testosterone, whether it's injected or transdermal or even oral. And like all hormones and like <laughs> cannabis, it depends on how you consume yes. it, you know, in terms of the impact it's going to have on the body and how it's going to be metabolized. No, yes. no, but I, th I think that's really important to point it, out it because is. when we look at things like liver and blood clots and all of that, you, just like estrogen with testosterone, you're only going to see that with oral, which is why we, when I say we, I'm talking about, you know, menopause experts and sexual medicine experts that are prescribing for women are recommending transdermal products. And I'm assuming you I like transdermal products. It's my go-to. Yeah. Uh, it's I very like hard. It's safer. Yeah. It's safer. It's very hard to get high, even high physiologic doses with it. Yeah. Um, it's hard to get into trouble with it. Yeah. It's hard to get into trouble with it. One more thing that just got published, which I think is helpful because I think in this discussion, we always need to look, how do we treat the men? How do we treat the trans men? How do we, what can we learn? Right. Because we're so like the, the thing with women is like, we're so fucking afraid to do anything to them. Right. But like we're, we give people 10 times the doses and we give yeah. men, right. All this stuff. So new paper came out looking at trans women, trans women frequently will have their testicles removed so that they don't have that high dose of testosterone. Right. In there. New paper came out saying, Hey, maybe we should give these people female physiologic testosterone doses because turns out their bodies do better with a little bit of testosterone. Yeah. So it's an interesting example of being like, we take out the testicles, they have, you know, the adrenal amount of, of testosterone, we give them estrogen, we thought that was going to be good enough. Turns out they benefit from that female physiologic yeah. dose testosterone also. Yeah. So one of the like, things that's really it, tricky about so all this though. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting and there's so many things, but one of the things that's tricky is very often people will say, okay, well, I'm going to have my blood drawn what level of testosterone do I need? And, and you know, you're question. smiling. I'm smiling because we know the lab suck. The level does not, well, first of all, the labs suck and it doesn't first necessarily all, correlate suck. with and they don't the correlate. effect that you're going to have. So that it's not like thyroid medication that you say, this is the level that we want. This is what we're going for. And then we're all happy. You know, it's yeah. not like that with testosterone. It's, it's complicated. We, do, we know that we don't want to go too high because we're going to get into trouble. But within that, there's a very, very wide range of where people are going to get benefits. I mean, think of, think of what else we need to know. How many androgen receptors do you have? What's your affinity of your androgen receptor to the testosterone? Like, we can't measure any of that in you, which is why your blood level is going to be different. The other thing we know about testosterone, and if anybody, yeah, it's just like, when you know so much about a topic, it's so fun. Your serum testosterone level does, even if the lab is good and accurate, which that's questionable, does not even correlate to the amount of testosterone that's circulating in your brain, right? right. So the serum test is actually a very blunt tool to say what's actually going on in your end organs. But like, you know, I volunteered in Africa and like they got an x-ray machine at this clinic. Everybody just wanted a freaking x-ray. Right. And then the doctor's like, you don't need an x-ray for everything. And people are like, but I just, you have an x-ray machine. Let's get an x-ray. And that's how I kind of feel about this testosterone labs is like, yes, it's so get funny one. When I volunteered in, in, in uh, Africa at a clinic, it was the ultrasound machine. Every pregnant woman wanted an ultrasound like every five minutes. Right. And so like, that's how I feel with labs is like, what lab should I be at? What's the optimal lab? And if you notice on my Instagram, I never say what I think the optimal testosterone lab is going to yeah. be. Because the yeah. people are going to hone in on that and it's way more nuanced than that. I think you should get one at baseline to make sure you don't have a person with high testosterone in perimenopause or menopause. I haven't found that person yet, but I'm, I'm looking. Um, and then check it six to eight weeks after to see that they're actually absorbing it, to see where they are. And the other thing to tell women on testosterone is when that second lab comes back, it'll be flagged as high. 
because the labs stay high on the female dose after about 40. And I'm like, I don't care what it says. How do you feel? Do you want to stay on And this? are you growing a mustache? And right. do you, are you having acne? And are you losing hairline hair so that you're looking like your balding uncle? You know, that's, yep. that's the kind of stuff we look at. But the, the level I think that's the most important, because when I look at, okay, what levels do I get? I get um, a testosterone level like you do, just to make sure it's not too high, just kind of know where we're starting from. I get a sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. I don't know if you do. We can talk yep. about that a little bit. It's interesting that if you look at the criteria, the recommended criteria, including ISWISH, which we're both involved in, and ISWISH has a protocol, and in their protocol is liver function tests and lipids. And I'm looking at that, and I'm going, Why? Because if you're giving a transdermal testosterone that does not get metabolized by the liver, it's going to avoid that trip through the liver, it's not going to have any impact at all on liver function and um, on lipids. Yep. So, so let That's me ask right. you, first of all, what labs you get to start, and then I want to spend a few minutes talking about sex hormone binding globulin, because I think that's an important concept. Yeah. Um, I, I did, you know, I, I learned... I learned through Ishwish. I was doing free testosterone so percentage I, yeah. for a while. In my experience, as I've grown confident in treating women and the doses I'm giving women, I just do a total testosterone mass spectrometry for the female because it's more accurate at the lower dose or at the lower levels, right? Um, that's that's really it. You don't get a uh, sex hormone binding globulin? Oh, yeah. Sex hormone binding globulin. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I don't get LFTs. Um, I, I like to know what the cholesterol is just because I think it's heart healthy discussion is worth having. You right. Know, it's hormones don't in exist general in, in life, but not. But the not data sh- doesn't support that physiologic dose female testosterone changes lipids. No. So, okay. You're more involved in a switch than I am. How come that's part of their protocol? I know you didn't I, write I, the paper. I don't write still. the protocols. Okay, I'm just I asking. Go, nah, uh-uh. But I think also people need to understand that when we get recommendations from societies, whether it's the Menopause Society or ISWISH or whatever, these are just recommendations. It's not the law. You know, this is but just the, guidelines. It, people use it as a law, and it's which, not. Is, which, is, which is wild. Well, it's, uh, it's problematic. And it's like everything else in life, Kelly. We, we use it when it helps us. Like when people say, do I ever have to stop using my hormone therapy? And I'm like, no, the menopause society says you can use it forever. If they didn't say that, I just wouldn't say it. <laughs> just say, <laughs> right, 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 so, right. It's like, mom, you know, you use it when, when it's going to benefit you and otherwise you just ignore yeah, whatever, whatever the protocol that's is. That's totally right. But, um, I always, going into lab, I always check a thyroid because I think TSH yeah. can, can masquerade as menopause symptoms well, a lot. When people say, should I get my hormone levels checked? I always say yes. Yes. You should get so your I thyroid think it, levels checked yep, because I think too thyroid. often, but what, one out of 10 women have alterations in their thyroid function midlife and it, they're not getting screened and they feel like caca and they think it's menopause when in fact it's thyroid disease. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've I've caught that a couple of times. Yeah. So I'm not a primary care doctor. <clears throat> I refer back. But, you know, hormones are only going to do what hormones are good. Like, they're not going to, yeah. they're not going to change your life, fill up your bank account, make every ache and pain go. Like, it's just like, the hope that is put on these hormones sometimes right. is not realistic. But I would say mm-hmm. I'm more optimistic with these hormones than a lot of people yeah. just because women come back to you and they say, I feel like myself again. Yeah. And, and how much that's the most joy you can get as being a doctor is for somebody to tell you that. So let's discuss, I'm actually, I'm uh, in the midst of recording a Q and a podcast because I get so many questions that come in like you and not one of them is enough for a whole podcast. So I've just kind of piled them up and I'm going to do a, a whole Q and a podcast. But one of the questions that, that came in that I was going to use, but we can talk about it now is a woman who um, said to me, I really want to take testosterone, but my sex hormone binding globulin, my um, SHBG is very, very high. And I have been told that I likely will not get a response. So number one, is that true? And number two, what can I do to bring it down? So just to start for the uninitiated, sex hormone binding globulin is a protein that we all have in our bodies, men and women, that among other things, it binds testosterone. And if testosterone is bound to sex hormone binding globulin, it's not active. It's the free testosterone that does all the wonderful things we've been talking about. So if somebody has a high sex hormone binding globulin, then they are less likely to respond to the kinds of dosages of testosterone that, that we normally give. So um, 
So I don't know about you, but I always I'm, start. I'm nodding in agreement for people who okay. can't see me. On so, the so, I, so, what, so one of the labs I get is a sex hormone binding globulin. And if it's high, I tell the woman, we can certainly try testosterone therapy, but you fall into the group that you may not get much of a response because it's all going to get bound up so that it's not going to do what it needs to do. What do you, what do you tell people? And, and then how do you approach that patient? Yeah. Well, they might, I mean, they might need higher doses, right? Cause you're okay, trying to one push. Of the questions is, do you, do you give higher dosages or is that just going to give them a mustache? I would just start out with regular doses and see what, see what their, their response is. Cause there's so many things that, that contribute to this. And, and then I would say, is there anything modifiable you can do to help right. decrease your sex hormone? Are you on oral estrogen? Are you on the birth control thing. pills? Yeah. Right. And, 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 and can you just, modify think, that? Yeah. Because when you go down the list of, okay, why, why would someone have a high sex hormone binding globulin? Well, some of it is just aging and, and life. Mm -hmm. It will get higher. But I think one of the number one things that we see in the postmenopause population is if someone is taking estrogen orally, not transdermally or vaginal or anything else, but if someone is taking oral estrogen, just like birth control pills, and that's true for perimenopause women, it's going to shoot, it's going to shoot uh, your SHBG high. And so sometimes just switching someone to a transdermal estrogen product is going to make the difference. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's something that's missed a lot. That's kind of an easy, easy fix. Thyroid yeah. dysfunction also, like to your point where you say you you check thyroid, because if someone has untreated thyroid disease, that's also going to mess up their, their sex hormone binding globulin. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so it's interesting because um, I'm maybe not as, um, I mean, I feel pretty comfortable with testosterone, but I'm I'm not necessarily comfortable with giving someone significantly higher doses than I normally would because I'm so worried about side effects. And so if I have someone that has a really high uh, sex hormone binding globulin, and if they're not responding to physiologic, um, I don't know that I'm comfortable going a whole lot higher. Yeah. And to me, you know, I'd start them on the standard dose, recheck their levels, see where they got with that, see what their goals are. You know, why does she want to be on testosterone? Is there something else you can do for that? Certainly. Yeah. Things can be nuanced. Let's, so, let's talk. I don't want to miss us talking, giving our opinion on pellets. Pellets are malpractice, is my <laughs> opinion. What's, what's your you opinion, go. Dr. Gaskin? Not that and I have an opinion. Scene. <laughs> Um, I think that the some I, I want to be very careful because I, I need to be very careful because some of these companies are nasty. Um, um, I'm, you know what? Come on. You and I, they're, they're, you and I take nasty all the time. I know. Um, they're, 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 for profit and pushy. How about yeah, push, is that, not is that safe, fair? It is not a safe way to give testosterone. People get sky high levels and they get into trouble. And yep. you can't control once they have pellets in there, you've got no, you can't dig it out. You have to sit there and wait and wait and wait. And these Both are the women you and that I we have see. seen some scary oh my God. shit. Yeah. Enlarged you know, Adam's apples. That any Permanent... guy would be proud to own is a penis, you know, kind of enlarge that are not reversible deepening not of reversible. the voice voice changes the hair loss is the biggest one which yeah. hair hair uh, hair doesn't like drastic significant hormone changes yeah. whether that's thyroid or anything so hair freaks out yeah i mean i tell i tell women it's like going from especially if you're starting out low which most people are when they yeah. get hormones you're at sea level and you get flown in a helicopter to everest base camp and dumped out yeah. Right. It's like, it feels very shitty, but, but you some know, people love it. They love it. But the other thing also, Kelly, is I think that this is an important point because when you say, okay, what's your opinion? And aside from the fact that we know that pellets have an increased risk of side effects, including an increased risk of pre cancers in the uterus and cancers because of these very high dosages of hormones. But that aside, when we talk about what's giving testosterone therapy a bad name, yes. it's pellets. It's pellets. If we were not having to counteract the problems with pellets, it would be a much easier job for us to talk about safety and efficacy of testosterone therapy but 100%, we are really Lauren. fighting two battles at once. We're trying right. to educate people on safe use and we're trying to fight that battle of, and, and then we've got the pellet pushers out there and the problem is all peace. The problem with pellet pushers is that they are creating problems as a downstream effect of, of other people who are trying to give hormone therapy responsibly. I agree. And I mean, I think the hallmark, in my opinion, the hallmark of a hormone expert is somebody who knows multiple ways to treat you. 
Yeah. Is it a cream? Is it a gel? Is it is it a pill? Is it a patch? Is it a blah, 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 right? Like I'm amazed uh, the number of people that think their only option for local vaginal estrogen therapy is a cream that no one has ever talked to them about, you know, inserts and tablets and rings and- And DHEA, which and is DHEA so And DHEA and so all these other things. Well, I, yeah, I mean, but yeah, DHEA, can we talk about DHEA the, for a second? But the, DHEA, the, 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 the hormone expert, in my opinion, has a, has a restaurant menu. So what I did in my in my not just selling one clinic taco. is I used to have baskets. So I had my hot flash basket, I had my vaginal dryness basket, and I would literally sit down with the woman and I would say to my assistant, let me have my vaginal dryness basket, please. <laughs> and she would bring the basket in and I would put every product on the desk. And I'd say, these are the six products that will solve your problem. And I'm going to tell you the pros and cons of each. And you say either yes or no, and we'll throw it back in the basket and see what we're left with. I love because that. Because people need to have choices. And when people say you wrote an entire book on vaginal dryness, you know, my slip sliding away, turning back the clock on your vagina. Yeah, I did. Because I have like one chapter on every product. But we've been talking really about systemic testosterone in terms of libido and even well-being and muscles and all that. We really haven't touched on using testosterone in the vagina and on the vulva. And I think we should talk about that for a minute because it's different. It's very different in terms yes. of our approach. And, you know, to be clear, we've mentioned that there's testosterone receptors, particularly in the lower third of the vagina um, and, and on the vulva as well. But my approach, and I'm assuming your approach to making sure those receptors are happy is not necessarily to give systemic testosterone that sometimes we use. And this is compounded off label. There's no product uh, for vaginal testosterone use, but, but in general for women who are having a really tough time and we're not responding to estrogen alone, and we ruled out other causes of problems, um, very often we would end up giving a concoction of either estrogen and testosterone mixed together for the vagina and the vulva or DHEA which mm -hmm. is a precursor for both estrogen and testosterone. Yes, so in, and in, in the breast cancer, in the breast cancer yeah. survivorship literature, testosterone alone. I know, it's that's, that's where the, the, I'd say the majority of the research is, or the published yeah. research on yeah. localized testosterone is because they were pushed their hand with, back, back in the never ever to estrogen phase, which I think yeah. is being more liberalized now in the survivorship community. But the, that's where a lot of the data is. Yeah. is. But, I, but I do think it's worth mentioning, at least I tell people, that I have no problem with using a local testosterone uh, on uh, parts of the vulva and, and in the vagina. But I do tell people not to put it directly on their clitoris. How yeah, about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll do estrogen cream on the clitoris. Oh, oh the more the better. And, 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 and if I see a clitoris that's atrophic, they're having issues with sensitivity or arousal, and if they're not estrogen cream responders, right, then I'll do the combined okay. estrogen testosterone to the okay, clitoris. Okay, but it will make the clitoris bigger, of course. Which and is I what wanna... we're going for when okay, it's, a, okay, when it's an atrophic quote, clitoris. I am going to quote a good friend of both of us, Dr. Rachel Rubin, who says, that a big clitoris is not more sensitive than a small clitoris because the biggest clitoris, of course, is a penis. And we know that a clitoris is at least tenfold more sensitive than a penis because of the number of yeah. nerve endings well, and the density. I, I don't think I'm disagreeing with that. To me, I'm like, yeah. size okay. doesn't matter, but when it's atrophic, you know, okay. you have diminished labia minora, right? You have signs of atrophy. Right. That's where I'm not just trying to get you a bigger clitoris. I'd shoot right, right, you up right. with I five know, pellets if I wanted to do that. But you do have to be careful with that is my point. Well, is, here, this is interesting, which I see a lot on social media, it's not in my community, is going, if you go back to male testosterone, some of the earlier male testosterone products, they had a patch and a gel, I believe, were applied to the scrotum. The reason is there's tons of receptors. It got into their body really well. And then they moved away from that. Right. So number one, even with the Ishwish approved local doses percentage wise, I've seen systemic uh, systemic lab values with labial, you know, vaginal testosterone cream. So watch out for that. It, I, I've seen it happen. Especially but, if people have very, very thin tissue. Yes. You know, it's counterintuitive because people that have the thin tissue um, are very often the ones that will absorb the most. And sometimes they're afraid of it. This goes for estrogen too. Yep. They'll say, well, I'm just going to use a little bit so because, you know, I'm scared. And it's like, no, that's when you slather it on because that's going to make your tissue thicker and it's not going right. to absorb as much. Exactly. Um, but I've, in the, I don't know what, what group is doing this, but some groups of hormone 
people are giving systemic testosterone and telling women to apply it to their labia and clitoris Bad to idea. get it into their bodies. There's no data on that. Yeah, and why do you, you don't need to touch your genitals every day to put on your daily transdermal testosterone dose. Yeah. So I think that confuses people yeah. when, when you're given systemic testosterone via application to your genitals. You can do it, but it's not necessary. All right. So one thing I want to circle back to that we got away from before we, I want to talk about your, your book, cause that's, you know, of oh, the moment, you. but um, let's talk about muscles yeah. because if we think in terms of the reasons why women are curious about testosterone or might want to go on it, one of them is the medical word is sarcopenia, you know, muscle yep. wasting, which occurs Death by with, sarcopenia. Hmm, yeah. And, and it's, and it's not just about, oh, I can't run a mile anymore. I mean, we know that people are ending up in nursing homes and falling and all kinds of other life altering and life threatening things. A major so reason that, that you have to go into assisted living. Yeah, you exactly. Can't do your activities a daily living. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the question is, do you think we have the data in women to support giving women systemic testosterone specifically to stave off sarcopenia? So we've established that we both think it's safe. We both think it can be used long term. But now we're saying, okay, do we have data that shows it's going to help your muscles? This is what people need to know. This is the like testosterone or hormones won't do it all for you. Giving, and this is, this is any gender data, giving testosterone by itself without weightlifting, without eating appropriately for muscles will do nothing for your lean body mass. You have to lift weights. You have to lift. You have to eat appropriately, especially the Gen Xers. We're trained to starve ourselves. Yeah. No, you, right? have, to, you have to We don't move. eat for muscles. We don't lift for muscles. So do I think giving women testosterone to save off sarcopenia is going to work? Absolutely not. Yeah. Well, do I, I, th- I have never I... seen any data to support that. And in fact, there's some data that shows it really doesn't do a heck of a lot. Because you, you have know? to lift. And you, you have, have to, to lift. Eat. You have to eat protein. You have to get stop the processed food for God's sakes. Yeah, stop um, the processed food. So and, yeah, and, I mean that's why when you get into sit, saying stuff like that on the you know on the internet of like testosterone for muscles, the asterisk and the longer conversation is like it won't do anything if you yeah, don't behave in a way to create muscles in your body. And. I think one thing we we should mention, because we assume everybody knows this, but they may not, is we're not getting into dosage, nor do we want to. That's something that you really need to meet with a clinician and see what's right for you. But do not borrow your husband's testosterone (laughs) because men um, require 10 times the dose of women. And I guarantee you that if you use your husband's testosterone in the dose that he is using, it will not end well. He'll be mad that his testosterone right. is gone yeah. and you'll He's be mad that you're growing a mustache. So yes. don't do that. You need to, this is not a do-it-yourself project. You need to work with someone who can really advise you into how to do this in a way that's not only going to be effective for you, but safe. Now yeah. talk about your book because we only okay, have a few the, minutes left. The book is called You Are Not Broken, Stop Shooting All Over Your Sex Life. I wrote it because women kept telling me all these things that could just be cured if we got a decent adult sex education, right? We get a teenage disease and prevent and pregnancy prevention plan if you were lucky growing up. But that's before you're in relationships. That's before you're in a long-term relationship. That's before you're in a career. What we really need is an adult sex ed to be like, oh, did you know that just putting something in my vagina does make 70% of women not have an orgasm, Right. Did we, did you know that the stress in my life actually affects my interest in having sex, right? Like all of the sex ed stuff that nobody ever got taught because you weren't an adult. You probably weren't even having sex when you had sex ed, right? No. Well, sex ed was all about safe sex. It had nothing to do with pleasure. Pleasurable sex. Yeah. So, and the other, I think the other big myth that we get fed is the Hollywood spontaneous desire at every moment for the rest Come of your on, life. Dr. Kasperson, within 14 seconds of penis and vagina, most women don't have an amazing orgasm. earth shattering orgasm like in the movies. Are you kidding? Like, there's this one, there's this movie. What is it called? It's Charlie's Theron and she's sleeping. She's very sexually attracted to Seth Rogen. She's like president and he's like a, a pothead. Yeah. It's it, it's implausible. But I like, saw the, that movie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but like, it's like their desire for each other is building up for like 45 minutes straight. And then it's like a simultaneous orgasm. It's like, that's not how your long-term relationship no. is going to be. You comparing no. yourself to that is like, 
well, it only makes you feel bad. Right. No. So really and like I, I wrote this book because I had started the podcast and that I love reading and people I'm like, people just like to consume content in different ways. So I kind of mm -hmm. threw it together in this book and I'm, I'm telling you, like you understanding that you're normal goes so far in you helping you have an amazing sex life. Women are well, like, it's, oh, it's I'm normal. Because, because one of my slides when I talk about this is the medical term for women who do not have an orgasm during intercourse, penile vaginal penetration. The med we have a medical term for that. And the medical term is normal. There's zero expectation. I love you said 30% that. or not even, I think that's awfully high, but awfully high. But, but, well, yeah, but and, and of the 30%, there is clitoral stimulation happening. Of course, because yeah. of pubic bone on clitoris or their whole, someone's holding a vibrator in the right place. So there's that. Um, but is it, a, do you have a second edition coming out or? It's just a re, it's a re, uh, so I self-published Yeah. and it did so well that a publisher bought it. I see. So, so I, now I it's going. It, I thought it was maybe an updated. Um, the only thing that's updated, I will give props to her because it's the only thing that I was like, this needs to be updated is when I wrote the book initially, we didn't know how many nerve endings were in the female clitoris except for the cow studies. 10,000, not 7,000. Yeah. And so I put Maria, uh, Maria Yolko and Blair Peters paper in there because yeah. now we actually know. Yeah. That was definitely worth putting updating. But I mean, a lot of this is, you know, not, it's, it's new in the fact that it hasn't trickled down to the lay population. Well, but that's exactly the point. I mean, I, you and I talk about this so much that we kind of assume that things are, that these are things everybody knows. And I cannot tell you how many people listen to my podcast, your podcast, read my books, read your books and say, I had no idea. And it's this reminder that we have to keep saying the same things again and again but also throw some new things out there for the people who do know. So I think that's, right, right. that's what we yeah, look at I know, as our like, role. Like the, I read the true definition of the, an expert is somebody who doesn't get bored by saying the same stuff over and over again. But it's like, you know, for me on the testosterone and Instagram, it's like to start the conversation. Right. Right. To start the conversation. To, and, but, and, and, you know, the other interesting thing, just to be picky for a second, people are like, the experts are saying everybody should be on hormones. 5% of women are on hormones. 95% of women aren't like, well, and when you say 5% or 6%, that's how many get a prescription. How many of them continue to fill it once they've read the black box warning, which right. is a whole nother topic, you know? So yeah. it's, it's, and in fact, one of the things I'm doing, I'm working on some stuff in the cannabis. Um, and I was working this morning with the graduate student that were writing this up for publication. And I said, a key part of this paper is why why are women turning to cannabis? They're turning to cannabis because you know, we only have 6% of people that are treating their yes. menopause symptoms. They don't trust big pharma. They don't trust their doctors. Their doctors aren't giving them information. Yet they're willing to do this huge experiment with something we know nothing about and use cannabis. And is it, well, that's a whole not, I won't get yeah. into that topic. No, I, I mean, I love but, but, that. But the point is, is that women have always been looking for solutions. And a million years ago, when I was on Oprah with Suzanne Summers, and I, you know, you want to do a do over in life. And I want to do it over because what I appreciate now that I didn't appreciate then is the reason that people were buying Suzanne Summers books and listening to her nonsense was because their own doctors weren't helping them and they were desperate for help. And Why for don't doctors know this, Lauren? Well, I'm trying we, to fix we, that. We, we I, I need to help going. people. We're, well, you and I are both doing that. I have some a bigger picture thing that I can't talk about yet, but something kind of exciting to help doctors learn this stuff because they need to. But on the good news, the menopause conference this year that both you and I will be attending um, sold out for the first time ever. And this is that's attended big. by healthcare clinicians, that's you know, doctors, I, nurse practitioners. So I that's, that's huge. That, yeah, I... Th I th Oh, I'm an There's optimistic hope. person. I think the tides are. Gen X is not going to age lying down unless it's lying down with a vibrator yeah. and maybe some cannabis. Yeah. But like they see their, the, this whole thing about aging well and the thing about hormones is hormones don't treat disease. Hormones prevent disease. You prevent. have to have the conversation now, not when you're 83 and can't get off the freaking toilet. Well, not to mention again, a whole other topic. The issue with the WHI wasn't that uh, you know, the hormones were bad. It said it was poorly designed and these women were given hormones after the damage was done. It's yeah. not there to repair your cardiovascular problems. It's there to, to prevent them and your yeah. bone loss and all of that. I mean, we all know that estrogen prevents progression from low bone mass osteopenia to osteoporosis. Once you have osteoporosis, you've got to do something beyond estrogen to help your bones. You right. know, the, the damage is done.
So yep. we could go on for like all day. What are you doing today? Can we we should going? we should really yeah. podcast more often. You know what? I we, we have to talk about this because podcasters I think this is really who podcast fun. with each other, it's a fun time. It is fun. And and I don't think we interrupted each other too much, did we? we I think we did good. I think we did really well. Let's give yeah, ourselves the people, a The know. people will let us know, but I'm sure they're going to want more. I, I think this is um, great. Thank you so much. I will see you in Chicago. This might air after NAMS, but you know, well, that's, people we'll, don't know we'll, that. Yeah, exactly. All right. I love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye.